بكت عيني بكت عيني بكت عيني على ذنبي وما لاقيت من كربي فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب الحمد لله All praise is due to Allah, the one and the unique. He it is whom we worship, and it is his aid that we seek. He fashioned Adam from clay and taught man how to speak. And he saved mankind from the flood by causing Nuh's ark to rest on Mount Judy's peak. So to him alone belongs all glory, for he has no partner nor any sharik. As to what follows, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us to be conscious of him when he says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Dear Muslims, one of the most famous economists of the last century of our own lifetimes, Milton Friedman, a name every single student of econ economics knows. He actually received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. He's one of the strongest proponents of Western capitalism. One of the points that this mind that is considered to be one of the intellectual geniuses of our generation made, one of the points that he brought up was that we need to, according to him, destigmatize greed. He said there's nothing wrong with being greedy in and of itself. Greed, he said, is the driving force of economic growth. Another senior analyst of Wall Street, somebody who became famous because he was involved in, in the 2008 Wall Street crash, and in fact, the movie was made about him. He famously remarked, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works, end quote. Another famous professor of economics in Boston wrote a highly acclaimed book entitled The Spirit of Capitalism, in which the argument was made, backed up by evidence, that the reason why some countries and nations are more successful than others is because of greed. Economic prosperity, this intellectual argued, strength, it comes from greed. That is why America is a superpower, because we are taught to crave, to yearn, to desire. We are taught to be better. We are taught to be competitive. Now, such frank sentiments are politically incorrect because religion from time immemorial has frowned upon greed. And even though it is rare to hear such blunt sentiments, the fact of the matter is that the society we live in, the capitalist economy that we find ourselves in, the culture that we're born into and raised in, it expresses this reality even if it doesn't state it. And we subconsciously absorb this paradigm even if we don't state it and preach it. In our movies, in our entertainment, in our social lives, in the experiences of our friends, we are indoctrinated to desire things we don't need and to need things we don't desire. This is the reality of our life. When everybody has something we never wanted, we never thought about, when everybody has it, we start feeling deprived. I don't have it. Something is incomplete. We might never have even thought about it. We never saw a need for it. But this is the way our culture is heading. Hence, today, in today's khutbah, I want to remind ourselves of the Islamic paradigm of wanting and desiring, of yearning. The Islamic paradigm so that we can understand our religion, our worldview is radically different from the capitalist system we find ourselves in. And it is important we remind ourselves of this constantly because unfortunately, unless we do so, we will become a part and parcel of everything around us. And subhanAllah, it is interesting to note that every single spiritual philosophy, every single faith tradition has come unanimously condemning greed. In fact, in the Catholic Church, they have seven deadly sins. One of them is greed. As we're probably aware, some of you are aware of Buddhism. The very notion of Buddhism is the root of human evil is to desire something, to want something. So the entire philosophy of Buddhism is what? 
Make sure you have nothing to desire. Eliminate desire from the heart and everything will be solved. But at the same time, even though we like to quote religious truths, and of course we're going to quote them, surely what these economists have said has a kernel of truth in it, no? I mean, in the end of the day, what will drive you and motivate you to raise the bar unless it is yearning and desiring? How will nations become powerful? What does prosperity come from except the desire to push the bar more and more? So how do we balance between these competing truth claims? And what is our view as Muslims when it comes to wanting something we don't have versus accepting our status quo? The secret to this response is in a very simple Islamic concept. And this concept is mentioned by all of the great giants of our tradition. The, the giants of theology, the giants of suluk and tasawwuf, the giants of the diseases of the heart, they all mention this because it is mentioned in the Quran. And that is the pillar of rida bil qadr, being content with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in today's khutbah, I want to illustrate and shed some light on what does it mean to have rida with Allah's qadr. We began by setting up the paradigm. We began by setting up the fundamentals. And of the most important of all fundamentals, Allah is the Rabb. Allah is the Malik. Allah Azza wa Jal is the King who is not challenged. Allah is the Razzaq who gives rizq. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Zukhruf, أَهُمْ يَقْسِمُونَ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّكْ نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا زُخْرِيَّةٍ وَرَحْمَةُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Are they in charge of Allah's mercy? Are they in charge of the treasuries of Allah? Do they decide how much anybody gets? Allah says in the Quran, نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ We have decided their salaries. We have decided their ma'isha, ma'isha their livelihood. We call it salaries. We have decided their income. We have decided their rizq, their status, what they're going to be. Who is in charge of how much money you're going to have? Who is in charge of how much wealth you will acquire? It's not you. It's not your efforts. It's not your talent. It is my and your Rabb. It is the Malik. It is the one who controls the heavens and earth. It is Allah Azza wa Jal. نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَةٌ فِي الْحَيْدِ الدُّنْيَا وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضٌ فَوْقَ بَعْدٍ دَرَجَاتٍ And we have raised some of them over others. It is Allah's sunnah. Some people are wealthier than others. Everyone has something the other person doesn't have. Why? لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا سُخْرِيَّةٌ So that each group can benefit from the services of the other. Each group needs something the other, doesn't the other has and it doesn't have. So even the wealthiest doctor, the wealthiest businessman, he needs to find somebody to fix his shoes, fix his cars, clean his house. Even the one who is cleaning the house needs to go to the doctor to get the medicine. Everyone needs the other, Allah is saying. We decide who gets what. We decide what is going to be your ma'isha in this world. So we begin by setting up the paradigm. Allah is in charge of my rizq and yours. Allah says in the Quran, we're not asking you for money. We're going to give you money. We're not asking you for wealth. I'm the one that's going to give you your wealth. So Allah has decided. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Every one of you shall get the rizq that Allah has preordained for him. Even if he runs away from it, he's going gonna, gonna to get. And if he runs towards it, he's going to get it. Doesn't matter what you do. Allah's rizq is going to come to you. What has been destined. Our Prophet ﷺ told us when the child is born, when the ruh is blown into the child, the angel asks four questions of Allah. One of them, how much rizq, ya Allah? How much is, wealth is he going to acquire? And Allah will give a number, the angel will write it down. That number, you cannot change it. You cannot change it. No matter what you do, your entire life, that is what you will be earning. Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed and predestined. You cannot change the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, we have chosen every person's status. نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا Which means, the second point, if Allah has chosen for you, 
This means Allah knows what is best for you. Allah is our mawla. Allah is our protector. Allah is our mawla. So whatever Allah decides is for my benefit and your benefit. Whatever Allah has decreed, it is going to be beneficial for me, even if I don't understand it. Beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Our Prophet ﷺ was distributing money, distributing wealth. And a companion next to him, perhaps Abu Bakr, we're not sure who, a companion next to him said, Ya Rasulullah, give more money to this man. Wallahi, he's a good brother. He's a good man. Give more money to him. The Prophet ﷺ didn't. A second time he said, Ya Rasulullah, give more money to this man. He's a good man. He didn't. Third time he said it. Wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, he's a good man. Give him more money. The Prophet ﷺ then turned and said, Sometimes I do not give a good person money because he will then use that money and it will lead him astray until he enters Jahannam. Not giving him money is better for him. Meaning, the Prophet ﷺ understood this man, his piety is of a different type and he's good where he is. If I were to give him money, it would destroy his piety. If I were to raise his rank in this dunya, he would lose out in the akhirah. So I'd rather he win in the akhirah and maintain where he is in this dunya. If this is something our Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of and he is a makhluq, what do you think of Allah who is the khaliq? If our Prophet ﷺ understood that this is a man, he should not have wealth because his piety will be affected. So I know he's righteous. I'm not denying he's righteous. But because he's righteous, because he's such a good person, because he's a person of Jannah, I don't want to corrupt him. And I know if I give him more wealth, potentially, possibly, he's going to become corrupt. I don't want to do that. So I'm withholding, not because he's not pious, but because he is pious. And I know his weaknesses. If this is something the Prophet ﷺ understood, and he is Rasulullah ﷺ, how about the one who sent him? Surely he understands more than this. And this is why we begin this by laying out the theological foundations. That there must be at some level, rida, acceptance of Allah's qadr. That's why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith is in Tirmidhi. Irdi, yani bi radi, irdi bima qasam Allahu lak, takun aghna nas. Be content with what Allah has given you. And you will find yourself the richest of all of mankind. This is a profound nugget of wisdom from the tongue of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be content with what you have and you will find yourself the richest person on earth. Ask yourself, the one who has a million but he wants another million, he's actually not rich because he's poor. He's poor for that other million. He wants something. The one who's a multimillionaire wants to become a multi-billionaire. He's actually psychologically poor. He wants to get to that level. Our Prophet ﷺ said, be content with what Allah has given you and all of a sudden, you don't desire anything. You have all that you want. You become the richest person on earth. This is rida bi qadarillah. This is what happens when we have rida with what Allah Azza wa Jal has given us. That's why in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet ﷺ said, the rich person, al-ghani, is not the one who has a lot of possessions. We would say the one who has a big bank account. The rich person is the one whose heart is content. Think about this. The rich person is not measured by the car that you drive, by the clothes that you wear, by the house that you live in. The rich person is decided by how happy his heart is, how content his heart is. If his heart is content and happy, that is the richest person on earth. This is what happens when we have rida bi qada illah, rida bi qadar illah. Now, somebody will say, does this mean that if I don't have any money, I just sit at home and be happy that I don't have money. No. This is not what rida means. Rida means that you submit to Allah's final decision with regards to how much it is you have. But there's an interesting catch. And it is in this catch that Islam becomes different from capitalism, from Catholicism, from Buddhism, from any other ism. That we have a unique philosophy and system. Rida means that you submit to the decision of Allah but you don't know what Allah's decision is. I repeat, Rida means you submit to the decision of Allah, but you don't know what the decision of Allah is. So how can you submit when you don't know? This is where we see the beauty of Islam. This is where we see the very interesting dynamics. 
The, the system of Islam has internal checks and balances to make sure that your greed does not consume you, to make sure that your desire for this dunya does not corrupt you. This is where checks and balances are put in. Listen to me carefully. Islam tells us it is permissible for the heart to desire that which is pure. But the iman and the brain must keep it in check that if you don't get it, then you are content that you don't have it. There's a checks and balances going on. It's okay to desire. And the body can strive to get it. And you put in the effort. But suppose you don't get it in the end. Suppose you don't get that business wasn't a success. You didn't get the promotion. You didn't get the fortune you thought that would come from this stock opportunity, from this venture. Okay, you tried. You desired. It's okay to desire but you also accept the final outcome. And you do not prioritize what you yearn for. That is another fundamental difference. We are taught in our sharia, it is okay to desire that which is pure. By the way, that which is pure, which means if it's impure, we should not desire it. Not everything that we desire is halal and good. Not everything that we want is beneficial for us. So the sharia has come and made certain things haram. For example, riba. We, it's an easy way to get rich when you have money, to give loans and to get more back. Easy way. But we might desire richness, but it harms other people. That's why Allah says that the harms are more. That's why Allah says that it's not going to make you rich, it's going to make society poor. So Allah has forbidden riba. Not every desire is pure. But if something is good and halal, and we desire it, the sharia says, go ahead, as long as some conditions are met. Of those conditions, your desire cannot interfere with that which is more important. We have a hierarchy of desires, a hierarchy of importance. The most important thing is our relationship with Allah. Our salah, our dhikr, our piety. That's why Allah praises the righteous people. رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ These are men. Allah praises their masculinity here. These are men. Neither their businesses, nor their wealth prevents them from worshipping Allah, praying and doing dhikr. Notice Allah didn't say, these are men who don't have businesses. These are men who don't have wealth. No, it's okay to desire wealth. It's okay to desire to have a bigger, bigger business. But the priority is not the wealth. Unlike in the capitalist system, unlike in the greed system, where the priority is profits, doesn't matter if the company is ethical or not, profits are always what dictates the market. No, there's a hierarchy, a priority. The priority, your iman, your salvation, your ibadat, and then the rules of the sharia, ah, what is haram and halal. Allah told you certain businesses are harmful, don't do them. Allah told you certain transactions are dangerous, don't do them. And then once it is a halal business, a halal merchandise, after that make sure it does not interfere with the wajibat, with your salah, with your rituals. After this, go for it. Our Prophet ﷺ said, how good is pure money for a righteous person? Go for it. How good is pure money for a righteous person? Meaning it's very good. Why should we not desire this dunya? Don't we pray to Allah, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana? But desire is not greed. Yearning is not haram. We put it in the priority list and put it number three, four, five. We desire good wealth. But at the same time, once we put in the effort, once we strive and it doesn't happen, then we accept rida. We accept and we say, what Allah has decreed is best for me. So we keep our yearning in check. We keep our desire so that it doesn't consume us. It becomes the biggest thing in the world. No, this is where Islam's philosophy is unique. Because realistically, realistically, you cannot live your life without desire like Buddhism wants you. You wouldn't be human if you don't have desires. What is being a human? You have yearnings, you have cravings, you have desire. Realistically, not everything that you yearn is evil, which is what some versions of Christianity say. Doesn't work that way. We all want to have good health, good life. We all want to have good wealth. In and of itself, it is permissible. So we can't agree with those Eastern systems that say any desire is wrong. But at the same time, capitalism comes and says 
every desire is good for society. You just be yourself and be greedy and that's going to be good for the market. There is a middle ground and the Sharia comes with this beautiful middle ground. It lays for us the theological understanding of wanting good. It lays for us the legal framework and then it puts our desires in check. It's not the most important thing. Go ahead and desire this dunya. But if you don't get it, accept Allah's qadr and understand there is a wisdom beyond your knowledge, beyond your intellect and Allah knows and you do not know. And this is the beauty of our Sharia. The intricate balance between wanting something for tomorrow and accepting today's status quo. That's what Rida is. You want tomorrow to be better, but deep down inside, whatever today is, you're happy at it. So every day you wake up, tomorrow should be better. I want more risk. I want better life. I want, and you strive for it. You don't just sit at home, think it's gonna rain down money. We know that's not tawakkul. We all have heard that's not Islam. You work, you're qualified. You have the best resume. You go knocking on doors. You expect a better tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, it's the same as today was. Alhamdulillah, Allah has something better for me. That's where Rida comes. You want the better tomorrow, but you accept status quo today. That is what the reality is. And if we have this philosophy, then subhanallah, we are do taking the best of all worlds here. And there are so many blessings of Rida with what Allah has decreed for us. Of those blessings, of those blessings. When you are content, then most of the grief and anxiety and stress and mental anguish that people get, you don't have it at all. Think about it. What makes you anxious? What makes you worried? It's the unknown. When you are rida bi illah, when you have taslim and tawakkul, when your heart is attached to Allah, all of a sudden you have lifted the worry and anxiety. We are in the hands of Allah and what Allah has decided is best for us. Of the benefits of Rida is that when you believe and have Iman in Rida with Allah's Qadr, you cannot be jealous. Jealousy comes from those who don't have Iman in Allah deciding who gets what. Think about this. One of our teachers would say, whoever is jealous at somebody else and what Allah has given them has in fact rejected Allah's Qadr and Allah's Rububiyyah. Because it is as if he is saying, oh Allah, why did you give him and not me? If you believe that Allah is the Rabb and you have Rida with Allah's Qadr, you can never be jealous. Because you know, just like the Prophet said, this person, if I give him money, he's going to go to Jahannam. I don't want to do that. When you have Rida, you understand maybe Allah has not given me to give me something better in the Akhirah. This is what happens when you have Rida. Of the blessings of Rida as well, as our Prophet said, have rida, we quoted the hadith, and you will be the richest of mankind. You really want to be rich? It's not going to be attained via economic wealth. It will be attained by a spiritual happiness. And spiritual happiness will come with a paradigm shift internally. You got to click, you got to switch it around and say, what Allah has given me, alhamdulillah. When you feel that way, you will be the richest person. And the final point we'll mention for this hadith, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves a group of people, He tests them. He tests them. Then He said, فَمَنْ رَضِيَّ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى وَمَنْ سَخِطَ فَلَهُ السُّخْطِ Whoever is content with whatever is happening, the rida. And again, content does not mean you have to be happy. What did we say? Content means you can work to change for tomorrow. But today you accept, oh Allah, you have decreed this. Qaddar Allah ma sha But tomorrow I want to try to be better. That's what content means. A lot of people misunderstand that rida means happiness. No, rida does not mean happiness. You can work to change the situation. But if it doesn't change, Deep down inside, your Iman says, what Allah has decided is better for me, even if I don't know. So our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will test people. فَمَنْ رَضِيَ Whoever has rida shall attain Allah's rida. And whoever gets angry shall attain Allah's anger. Simple as that. You want Allah's rida? You have to be radi with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the highest praise the Sahaba were given is what? Half a dozen times in the Quran, how does Allah describe the Sahaba? Radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an. They are content with Allah, and in return, Allah is content and pleased with them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are content and pleased with Allah. 
May Allah bless me and you with him through the Quran and may he make us of those who his verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness to you as well. Ask him for he is the Ghafoor and the Rahman. Alhamdulillah, al Wahid, al Ahad, al Samad, al Ladi, lam Yalid, walam Yulad, walam Yakulla, Kufu, and Ahad, Wabadu. Brothers and sisters, while it is completely permissible to desire the good of this world, I also have to be a little bit more academic and tell you the spectrum of desiring. You see, our religion is so beautiful, it is so perfect that Allah has catered to all of mankind. And Allah has catered to people who are willing to sacrifice this world for the next. And Allah has catered to those who don't have those high aspirations. And they just want to get by into Jannah and live a good world. The beauty of this religion, it caters to all of mankind. So, when it comes to the spectrum of yearning and desire, when it comes to wanting things you don't have, there is a spectrum of permissibility and a spectrum of impermissibility. And on the spectrum of permissibility, not everything is the same. Some things might be permissible, but not praiseworthy. And others are permissible and praiseworthy. And others are permissible, but not really praiseworthy, but not sinful. It's a spectrum. And if you look at the life of our Prophet ﷺ, you attain, obviously, the highest understanding of what that spectrum is. Now it is completely permissible to desire this dunya and to sacrifice the halal to gain other halal sacrifice your sleep sacrifice things that are halal for the sake of other halal totally permissible and at some level it is obligatory we all have to go to work to earn an income we all have to get risk to sustain our families that balance of how much we want and at what cost and at what cost of the akhirah as well? Because in the end of the day, you have 24 hours. How much will you dedicate to the deen versus the dunya versus your family? These are things Allah has allowed some leeway in the sharia. And each one of you has to decide where you want to be on that spectrum. So as long as what you desire in and of itself is not haram, and you are not sacrificing the wajibat, then you are safe. It's okay. You want to be a multimillionaire and you want to dedicate your life to be a company CEO and found this and spend 80, 90 hours a week in doing that. And you're praying, you're taking care of your wife and children, you're doing a part of your services to the ummah, giving your zakah, fasting Ramadan. Guess what? You've made Jannah, no problem. Go get, become the multimillionaire. But at the same time, there are those who understand if I do this, then I cannot dedicate the time to the ummah and the khidmah of the khalq and being good to mankind and worshipping Allah that will give me a higher place in Jannah. So they're going to cut back on that in order to increase this. And of course, there's no doubt that that is better for the sake of the akhirah. But Allah realizes, Allah knows not everybody is the same. So He's allowed this spectrum. And if you look at our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is the epitome of perfection for us. Did he appreciate the halal pleasures of this dunya? Wallahi, he did. He loved to eat meat. He was gifted fine clothes. He wore them. He himself said, getting married is from my sunnah. But, and I have to be clear, did he ever go out of his way to acquire fine clothes? Did he ever sacrifice immensely to acquire a fine meal? No. That was not his priority. Now again, that is the epitome. And I'm just saying this so that we are clear in this regard. That you want to go to the highest of the high, the priority is indeed the deen. The priority is indeed the worship of Allah and helping mankind. But not everybody's to that level. And so if we desire more of this dunya, as long as it is halal, and we don't sacrifice the haram, we don't get into the haram, then it is all permissible. And that's this beauty of this faith that no matter what your level, and this is, you know, the rich, richest person in human history was Qarun. And Qarun could have been a righteous person if only he shifted his paradigm. Qarun, the one who was destroyed for his arrogance, he was a multi-billionaire. And he could have been a righteous person if only he thanked Allah and gave the zakah. But he refused even to do that. In and of itself, wealth is a tool. It is a harmful tool insofar as, generally speaking, wealth is more corruptive 
But it's not necessarily corruptive. It's not necessarily corruptive. It's up to you and your iman. So if you get involved in this world and you acquire more and more, then make sure that with that privilege, your responsibility to Allah and your responsibility to the creation of Allah increases. And beware, brothers and sisters, beware of that companion whom the Quran mentions. He used to be a companion, he became a hypocrite. That companion whom the Quran mentions, the Surah Tawbah. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ عَاهَدَ اللَّهَ لَإِنْ آتَانَا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ لَنَا الصَّدَّقَنَّ وَلَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ There are those who promised Allah, Oh Allah, you make me rich. And I will show you how generous I will be. I will show you I will be the best of the best. فَلَمَّا آتَاهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ بَخِلُوا بِهِ وَتَوَلَّوا When Allah gave them that wealth, they turned around. They became stingy and they rejected and neglected with promises they made Allah. Don't think, dear Muslim, when you don't have wealth, I know when I become wealthy, I will be like this and that. No, the Prophet ﷺ realized that righteous person, he was righteous and he was fine where he was. Try to acquire whatever you want. When you acquire, raise your own religiosity, raise your own ibadat, raise your own piety, raise your own sadaqah, and frank advice to myself first and foremost, and then to all of you. If with increased blessings, you do not find increased spirituality, then perhaps you should not be interested in more worldly blessings. If when you rise up in the ranks of this dunya and Allah gives you your promotions and you get your medical degree and you get your residency and you get your CEO and you get your comp company and you get it on the stock market and you find that, you know what? When I was 25 years old, I used to pray better. I used to be more sincere. Now that I'm 45, 55, 65, my heart has become hard. Even though you are double, triple, ten times wealthier. Well, then ask yourself what happened and what went wrong. It's never too late to repent, but be careful because with privilege comes responsibility. And if you don't have that responsibility and you're not demonstrating to Allah that you're worthy of that, well, then something is wrong. And I conclude this khutbah by a beautiful hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that really encapsulates what it means to be the pinnacle of piety. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَرُزِقَ كَفَافًا وَقَنَّعَهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا آتَاهُ The one who is a Muslim and has been given enough to live a bare minimum life. You're not starving. You're not in debt. Kafaf, kafi, kafaf. The one who has been given riz that is kafi for him and he is content at what Allah has given, that person is the most successful of mankind. This is what our Prophet ﷺ said. The one who is a Muslim and he has what he needs to live. Alhamdulillah, food is there, drink is there, house is there, family is there. You have enough to live. And then he is content with what Allah has given. That person is the most successful of mankind. So yes, it's halal to yearn. Yes, it's halal to want more. But I'm going to be honest here. It's better and more blessed to not desire things you don't need. And to be free of being impoverished to things you never thought you knew until some commercial comes along or some other friend of yours shows you something or society teaches you something. No, the best blessings of this world are mentioned in the Quran. And that is, أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعَ وَأَمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خوف. This is the bare minimum. You have enough to feed yourself and you're living in a safe land and country. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. That is the minimal that is required. If you have it, the more content you are, the richer you're going to be. And if you desire more, I explain the Islamic paradigm. If you stay within this paradigm, all is good and khair. And alhamdulillah, the sharia caters to all. Allahumma inni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la da'in fi hadhi yawm idhamman illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la da'inan illa qadayta. Wa la مريضا إلا شفيت ولا عسيرا إلا يسرت اللهم اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بسوء فاشغله بنفسه وجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز 
قال عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاء القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكر يزيد لكم ولا ذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رجل